Hello again, everyone. Uh, this talk is Measuring Model Fairness uh, with Henry Hinnefeld. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Henry Hennefeld. I'm a data scientist at Civis Analytics. And today, I'm going to talk to you about measuring model fairness. Before we jump right into it, I'll start with an outline of where we're headed. I'm going to start by motivating the problem a little bit. And the problem I'm talking about here is specifically measuring model fairness, not model fairness writ large. There was a really great talk earlier today about that, so I encourage you to go find the video for that later if you're interested. But today, I'm specifically talking about the problem of measuring the fairness of a model's predictions. This is actually a pretty tricky problem. So next, I'll talk through some of the subtleties that make this hard, and then talk through a case study using some real-world data that shows how these subtleties show up in practice. Finally, I'll talk about some Python tools, some open source tools you can use to address these problems in your own work, and end with some concluding remarks. So at this point, I think it's pretty commonly accepted that machine learning models can have a big impact on people's lives. Things like credit scoring models can determine whether or not you can buy a home. Advertising models can affect what kind of job offers you're exposed to, what kind of credit products you see. And models can even affect how long you spend in jail. Now, as machine learning models have made their way into these really socially impactful domains, a consensus has emerged that it's really important that we make sure the predictions of these models are fair. Unfortunately, that's kind of where the consensus ends, because there are many different ways to define fairness, many different ways to measure the fairness of model predictions. And this last example is actually uh, a really illustr illustrative case for that. So a quick show of hands. How many of you all have heard of the compass recidivism model controversy? That's a pretty good response. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, there is a model called Compass, which is used to predict recidivism, so to predict the likelihood that a person convicted of a crime will go on to reoffend when they're released, so go on to be convicted of future crimes. This model is used uh, pretty widely across the country in making parole decisions. And so, uh, a little while ago, this organization called ProPublica, which is an independent investigative journalism outfit, uh, found out about this and went out and collected some data. First, about the scores that this model was generating, and second, about the actual outcomes, so about whether people actually did go on to uh, recidivate. And what they found when they analyzed this data was that the model's error rates were different for people of different races. So the chart I have here is comparing the uh, false positive rates and the false negative rates for white and black defendants. So the false positive rate is the, the fraction of people that the model labeled as high risk, but who actually did not go on to reoffend. Similarly, the false negative rate are the people that the model said had a low risk of reoffending, but did go on to reoffend. And if you look at these error rates for the Compass models, well, the false positive rate, the people falsely labeled as high risk, that error rate is about 24% for white defendants and about 45% for black defendants. And on the other hand, the false negative rate, the people that the model uh, falsely said were at a low risk of reoffending, that error rate is about 48% for white defendants and about 28% for black defendants. So ProPublica went out, collected this data, did this analysis, and on the basis of this analysis, wrote a report saying this model used in parole decisions is biased against black defendants. Seems pretty cut and dried so far, right? Well, the second half of the story is that the company which makes this model, which makes this product, the company North Point, put out a rebuttal where they showed that the overall accuracy, so the overall error rate, or I'm sorry, the overall just accuracy of this model is very similar for white defendants and black defendants. So the overall accuracy is about 63% for both groups. So this leaves us with a question. Is this model fair? Who's right? Which is the appropriate way to measure the fairness of this model, of this model's predictions? Intuitively, you might think, 
well, let's just satisfy both conditions. Let's make sure that the error rates are balanced, and let's make sure that the overall accuracy is also balanced. Unfortunately, that's not possible. As this controversy was coming out, uh, some academics took a look at the problem and proved mathematically that, except in very contrived cases, cases where, for example, your model is 100% correct, it just gives you the right answer every single time, except in contrived cases like that, it's mathematically impossible to satisfy both of these definitions of fairness at the same time. So we're left with this question of, how do you decide what is an appropriate way to define fairness for your machine learning modeling problem? How do you, how do you define this and how do you measure it? This is a really tricky problem with a lot of subtleties. So next, I'm going to talk through three of these subtleties and how they impact this problem. The first subtlety is that different groups can have different ground truth positive rates. So to illustrate this with an example, say you were trying to make a model that predicted diagnoses of breast cancer. Well, men and women are diagnosed with breast cancer at very different rates. Uh, for women, it's approximately one in eight, so something like 12% over the course of a lifetime. And for men, it's something like one in a thousand, so 0.1%. So there's a very different incidence rate, a very different true positive rate in the ground truth between men and women for this type of problem. Well, this, is, this makes measuring fairness tricky because certain fairness metrics make assumptions about the balance of ground truth between groups. One of these metrics, which is a very popular one, is called disparate impact. And the, In words, what disparate impact is measuring is the ratio of the probability of a positive classification between two different groups. So that's this equation down here, the probability that you get a, a yes or a positive classification for different groups. And because this is a ratio, you want it to be very close to one according to this definition of fairness. But if we think back to our breast cancer modeling problem, you can see how this definition of failure just falls on its face because the ground truth positive rate is very different between our two groups. And so that conflicts with an assumption that this fairness metric has baked in. So subtlety number one, there can be legitimate differences in the ground truth positive rate between different groups that you're looking at. Subtlety number two is that you don't know what ground truth is. You only know what your data says, and your data is a biased representation of ground truth. There's a, a quote from the statistician George Box that I like a lot, which is that all models are wrong, some models are useful. And I think you can uh, kind of paraphrase that into the data context by saying all data sets are biased, some data sets are useful. So you always have to remember that your data isn't an exact representation of the real world of ground truth. Uh, data can be non-representative in a couple different ways. And one of those ways is that it can contain label bias. So label bias is when a protected attribute affects the way individuals are assigned labels. People from different groups get assigned labels differently in your data set. As an example of this, uh, consider this quote from an analysis of school discipline. Uh, in this paper, the authors found that students from African-American and Latino families were more likely than their white peers to receive expulsion or suspension for, the similar, for similar problem behavior. So if you were using this data set and trying to predict student problem behavior, but your label was has been suspended, then you're working with a data set that has label bias because different groups are being assigned labels differently. This is a problem for measuring fairness because some fairness metrics are based on your agreement with the labels. And if your labels are biased, then making sure that your predictions agree with those labels is just perpetuating the bias that was in your data set in the first place. Uh, a popular example of one of these metrics is called equal opportunity. And equal opportunity is comparing the true positive rate between different groups. So this is given that in the data set you are labeled as a one, what is the probability that the model classifies you as a one? And looking at the difference in that rate between the two different groups that you care about. But again, here, you're optimizing for agreement with these labels. And if the process that generated the labels themselves is biased, then all you're doing is perpetuating the bias that generated your data in the first place. Another way your data can be non-representative 
is that it can contain sample bias. Sample bias is when different groups are sampled into your data set in different ways. So as an example of this, uh, consider this quote from an analysis of the NYPD stop and frisk policy. And in this analysis, they found that uh, people of African and Hispanic descent were stopped more frequently than white people, even controlling for various other factors. So if you were trying to build a model on top of this data set, you would be working with something that had sample bias, because whether or not a person shows up in your data set in the first place is different for different groups. The sampling process is different for different groups. I think you see where this is going. This is a problem for measuring fairness, because some metrics look at classification ratios between groups. So here I'll go back to disparate impact. This was the first metric we talked about, the one that's comparing the ratio of the positive classification between groups. Well, if you're sampling the groups differently, then the things that you're comparing in this ratio is not an apples to apples comparison. If you're sampling, for example, only high risk individuals in one group, but then an entire population uniformly in another group, when you do that ratio, you're not getting an accurate assessment of how your model is treating those different groups because the populations aren't sampled the same way. It's not an apples to apples comparison. So to recap so far, subtlety number one, there can be legitimate differences in the ground truth positive rate between classes. Sample number two, your data is a biased representation of ground truth. Subtlety number three is that the consequences of your model matter. I can see an argument where if your model is punitive, so the consequences of your model is negative, it's handing out something like more jail time, then you might care more about false positives. You might care more about the cases where your model is assigning someone a punishment that they don't deserve. On the flip side, if your model is assistive, if your model is handing out a benefit to people who need it, I can see an argument where you care more about false negatives, about where your model says a person doesn't need this benefit, but they really do, and they aren't getting it as a consequence. Uh, I'm not arguing that this is the only way to think about assist assistive and punitive models. I'm just saying you have to think about these questions. And this takes me to what is actually the main point of this talk. If you don't remember anything else from this, this is what I want you to come away with. You can't math your way out of having to think about fairness. You still need a human person to think about the ethical implications of your model, of the tool that you're building. When machine learning and this kind of modeling approach first started being applied to these different types of domains, at the beginning, there was a kind of a common impulse to think, well, models are just math, so they must be fair. You know, it's just, it's just numbers, it's just algorithms, it's math, of course it's fair. At this point, I think that attitude is pretty thoroughly debunked, but there's a temptation to take the same kind of reasoning and apply it just one step farther down the modeling chain. It's not models are math, so they must be fair. It's I'm going to add this extra constraint to my math, and it will automatically be fair. And that's still not automatically true. You need a human person thinking about what does fairness mean in my context? What does it mean? What are the consequences? You need that person doing that thinking before you can say, this constraint makes my model fair. So these are some of the ways it can be tricky. So far, this has all been kind of uh, theoretical. So next, I'm going to walk through a case study that uses some real-world data from, one's, from one of Civis's consulting engagements to show how these kind of effects can show up in practice. So the way this, uh, this case study is set up is we start with some real-world data from one of our consulting engagements. The, uh, the features we have here are mostly demographic things and like socioeconomic status indicators. Uh, and the outcome in the original raw data set is the probability that a person will sign up for the services of a state agency. So each row in the data set is a person, and the outcome is the likelihood they sign up for this agency. And we're going to investigate uh, racial bias, so look at fairness for white people versus black people in this data set. And the way we're going to proceed is we're going to generate hypothetical worlds that match these different subtleties I've been talking about. So we'll generate a hypothetical world where ground truth is balanced, and another hypothetical world where ground truth isn't balanced. To make the ground truth 
balanced, we take only the white people in the original data set and then randomly reassign race labels. So in that hypothetical world, ground truth is totally balanced. We also take the original data set where white people were much more likely to sign up for the services of this agency as a hypothetical world where ground truth is not balanced. So remember, this is subtlety number one. Ground truth isn't always balanced. Subtlety number two was that your data can be a biased representation of ground truth. So within each of these hypothetical worlds that we've generated, we're going to generate some new data sets where we inject known types of these different biases. So for example, we generate a data set where we inject sampling bias by preferentially sampling white people and black people differently from that hypothetical world. So we sample white people with a high score with a high likelihood, sample white people with a low score with a low likelihood, and then sample black people uniformly. So by this, by this process, we're generating a data set that we know has sample bias. And similarly, we can do a, a, a related kind of thing where we take those original probabilities and turn them into binary labels, but we do that differently for the different groups. So this way we introduce label bias. So we use a threshold of 0.3 for white people and a threshold of 0.7 for white people. So at this point, we have two hypothetical worlds, one where ground truth is balanced, one where it's not. And we have a number of different data sets where we know there's different types of bias in the data set. Then what we do is we train models on those different data sets in those hypothetical worlds, and then apply the two fairness metrics I've been talking about so far, disparate impact, which is that ratio one, and equal opportunity, which is that difference one. We apply those two metrics, two models trained on these different data sets, and see what the fairness metrics tell us. So first, when gr ground truth is balanced, this is the hypothetical world where ground truth is totally balanced, things look pretty good. So to explain this figure, I have uh, on, can you see my arrow? Yeah. On the left over here is disparate impact. So this is the ratio one. So that means a value close to one indicates no measured unfairness. Over here on the right is equal opportunity. This is the difference one. So a value close to zero means no measured unfairness. And then the different bars are different data sets that we generated. So on the far left is one where we haven't done either of these bias injecting processes. Then the next one is where we injected sample bias, where we injected label bias, and where we injected both types of bias. And so what you can see here is that both of these metrics measure no unfairness in the case where we haven't added bias to the data set. And as we start adding these different types of bias into the data set, the metrics report more measured unfairness. So, so far, so good. The metrics are doing what we want. The situation is a lot less rosy in the hypothetical world where ground truth is imbalanced. So here we're saying this is a hypothetical world where there's a legitimate difference between different groups. Think back to the breast cancer example. And now these are the, the same plots, the same interpretation. So a value of one over here on the left plot means no measured unfairness. A value of zero over here on the right plot means no measured unfairness. Now both of these metrics are detecting significant unfairness, even in the case where our data is totally representative of the real world. We haven't injected any of these biases. Our data is just the real world. But these metrics are telling us that our model is very, very unfair. And also, you'll notice the label bias, this is when different labels are assigned uh, different labels differently, is very hard to detect. And that's because in this case where ground truth is imbalanced, it's really hard to tease apart where differences in labels are between uh, biased data generating process and just the ground truth. So the point I want you to take away from this case study is that it's really hard to interpret these fairness measures in a vacuum. If you were doing this kind of analysis, if you were trying to measure the fairness of your model's predictions, you don't get all four of these bars, or all eight of these bars. You don't get to see like, well, this is what it would look like in this case. This is what it would look like in this case. You just get one of these numbers. And you have to interpret that number by thinking about the world you're trying to model and the process that generated your data. You have to think about, is ground truth balanced in this problem I'm trying to model? You have to think about, where did my data come from? Is it possible that the labels are being generated in a biased way? Is it possible that the sampling is different between these two groups? You have to think about all of these questions when you go to interpret the numbers of these that these fairness metrics generate for you. So that's kind of how this 
works in practice. Next, I'm going to give you a couple tools from the Python ecosystem that you can use to do these kind of measurements to apply to you know, measure the fairness of your predictions. Uh, the first of this is called Equitas. This is a tool out of the University of Chicago. It's a Python library and also a web front end. And the way it works is you provide some data. Within that data, you select what the protected group is. So if you're interested in looking at uh, race or gender or age or disability status, something like that. Then you select which fairness metric is appropriate for your context, which metric makes sense for the problem that you're working on. And then the tool will go off and tell you, according to the data that you provided and the model scores you provided and the fairness metrics that you said are relevant, how do those metrics evaluate on your data set? Uh, pros of this tool is that it's easy to use. The con is that it comes with a non-standard license. So it's from University of Chicago. It has an academic license, which isn't one of the standard MIT, GPL, whatever. Uh, another tool comes from IBM, and this is called the AI Fairness 360 Open Source Toolkit. Uh, the pro here is it's very comprehensive. It has implementations of many, many different fairness metrics, along with lots of documentation, tutorials, Jupyter notebooks that will walk you through the use of them. Uh, the con is that it's probably more comprehensive than you need. There's a ton of stuff in here, also implementations of some research papers. Uh, and it also comes with lots of dependencies, so if you're trying to bundle this into a production environment, it might be a, a heavier import than you want. And finally, another class of tools are things that you can use to interpret models. I'll mention these in passing because they're a whole other topic and I don't have time to go into them here. But if you're interested in understanding why a model is making a particular prediction, I suggest you look into these tools, Lime and Shap. So finally, some concluding thoughts. There's no one-size-fits-all solution to this problem other than think hard about your inputs and your outputs. Think hard about the world you're trying to model, about the problem you're trying to model. Think hard about the process that's generating the data that you're using. And then think hard about the consequences of your model downstream. Where are these scores going? What kind of decisions are being made based on the output of this tool that you're building? These metrics can help and others, but you have to use them carefully. Second, use a diverse team to create these models and do this thinking. Throughout the course of this talk, I've tried to emphasize how important it is to have a human person doing this kind of thinking. But if all of the people doing that thinking come from the same background, the same social context, the same lived experiences, then you're going to have blind spots. So when you're doing this kind of ethical inspection of your models, do that with a diverse team so you have different perspectives on, on the question. And finally, just know your data and think about your consequences. I'll leave you with this quote from Kathy O'Neill's book, uh, Weapons of Mass Destruction, about how it's the job of all of us who build these kind of models and build these kind of tools to do this ethical introspection. You know, your, your data is not the truth, and even if it were the truth, is it the kind of truth that you want to see in the world? That's a deeply human question, and you really need people thinking about it. Thank you. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Sure. I'm happy to take questions if people want to step up, and I'll also be up in the front if we get cut off for time. I have, I have a question. Um, so, basic, I, like you seem like a very civic-minded person, and I was just wondering, um, how do you deal with pushback? If so, first of all, have you ever um, experienced like pushback? Uh, in your workplace when you kind of say that like, all right, you know, we need to think about this fairness and then you get kind of the reaction, yeah, well, you know, um, you know, math is fair, it's objective, this isn't really the place for politics. Um, and secondly, so first of all, have you encountered that? And secondly, um, how do you respond to that? Uh, to your first point, I'm fortunate to work at a place where I think these kind of ideas have a lot of currency, so I don't get a lot of... Uh, institutional pushback on just like raising the issue in the first place. Um, as to how I would address it, I think there are, there are a couple different tacks you can take. Uh, one, you can try and take an education type tack where if someone does come in with the perspective, the models are just math, of course they're fair, then you can try to uh, 
kind of present some of this kind of reasoning to say, well, that's actually not quite accurate and try to educate whatever stakeholder is pushing back. Um, if it's a case where people understand the problem but don't want to like make the profit sacrifice, uh, that's just a much harder kind of interpersonal corporate dynamics kind of problem. And uh, the best I can tell you is that you just have to advocate for it. Thank you. That was a really fucking awesome talk. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, on the right side. Given the issues with uh, ground truth, uh, ground truth rates being different depending on what sort of uh, what sort of labels you're looking at, is it possible to normalize them while possibly uh, while possibly controlling for any sort of sampling bias? There are definitely uh, approaches you can take in that direction. So there's actually a pretty substantial body of like academic literature around how you can do this kind of rebalancing data sets or uh, reweighting data sets to try to remove some of these issues. Uh, I think there's promising work in that direction, but with the caveat that you really have to do this thinking ahead of time. You can't uh, throw your data set into an algorithm that like translates it in such a way that now everything is independent of gender or something without thinking ahead of time about the problem you're trying to model and whether that kind of approach makes sense. So sh short answer, yes, there are mathematical approaches in that direction, but you have to use them carefully. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Oh. How does Compass compare to just human judgment? I mean, I, I presume Compass is replacing human judgment in these matters. Uh, I think Compass is one element that judges use in making their decisions. Um, I don't know offhand of a uh, comparison I can give you of like the decisions judges make with and without the Compass input. Um, that, that's a good question, but I don't have a good answer for you. So you mentioned a couple of times that you need a human to consider this equation and consider uh, possible biases and how to manipulate or how to how to work with your data in the in light of that. Um, I'm curious if you like there isn't a formula for that. I'm curious if there are resources you know of that provide something in the direction of a formula or at least a starting place for people for people for issues that people should consider when approaching these problems. Um. So uh, I'm not familiar with this tool myself, but the earlier fairness talk today mentioned this uh, Dion checklist, which was uh, presented as like a checklist for ethical questions when you're building a model. Uh, I'm a little hesitant to recommend it, having not read it myself, but that sounds like something in the direction of what you're asking about. Is that fair? Yeah. OK. Um, I think we're about at the end of time, but I'm happy to stand up front and keep taking questions. So thank you for your attention. <laughs>